Thank so, you. Sorry for the delay. So, so uh, all right. Uh, how to talk about reproducibility is what this for calculations. That's a bit narrow subject. Uh, am I clear? Well, no, you're not. No, it doesn't matter. Okay, all right. Um, all right. So, uh, but of course, uh, I'd like to speak a little bit more general. Uh, and by the way, the subject of irre irreproducibility is not new. At all, uh, this journal of reproducible results has been published since about 1950, maybe even before that. This is just an ex excerpt from uh, one uh, beautiful paper of many published in this magazine. Uh, but anyway, going uh, to a more serious note, so I actually going to speak first about generic problems, which I'm. You know, this type of uh, irreversibility, which are listed here in roughly increasing order of severity and decreasing order of likelihood. Uh, and then what I consider to be the, uh, mentioned before, the biggest problem in this uh, aspect, and then a little bit about specific problem in uh, my narrow field. Um, so is right. So, uh, mm -hmm. This is an, I will present several, I think, interesting case studies. One is going as long back as about 1930 in my alma mater, which is Lebedev Physical Institute in Moscow. In 1930s, the voltage in this uh, power outlets in Moscow was known to be unstable. So they were, that was a group which was uh, looking for some theoretically predicted effect. And they were honest and very diligent, and they did a lot of measurements. When they did not absorb the desired effect, they thought it might be something might be wrong, and they were checking the voltage. And if the voltage was outside of the acceptable margin, they would just discard this, uh, this datum. And after the e a year, they had a statistically solid proof of the effect, which actually turned out to be uh, non-existent uh, based on the statistics of their measurement. I think that's a very, very, good um, example of um, how this thing can happen uh, subconsciously. And um, mm, this is, for instance, in calculations is um, not uncommon that people do calculations sort of like improving conversion, improving accuracy, and as soon as they, they get the result that they want to get, they stop checking uh, things any further. Absolutely unacceptable way to do that. Now, intentional misvisualization. I would say that you're not lying, but you are trying to present your data, say, on logarithmic scale, on exponential scale, in such a case that disagreement between your data and the model that you are uh, pushing forward uh, is not really visible. So this is a paper which was um, not was not a um, biggest part of that paper, but that basically were, they were measuring cold conductivity and they needed to extract intrinsic from extrinsic. There was a semi-empirical, there was a, some justification, but not very rigorous, uh, that there is a scaling of um, mm, of whole conduct resistivity with respect to uh, linear resisti uh, um, resistivity. Uh, uh, and that um, this part, which is, there's one part which is intrinsic coming from the berry phase effect and so on, and the other which is extrinsic coming from impurity and stuff. So uh, these are the data from different group from my colleague, but the, the experimental data is basically indistinguishable from the one that this group used. And they plotted that on the linear scale, and you can clearly see that, uh, that there is a systematic deviation from this formula. Now, uh, the way how these people plotted that, they plotted that on double logarithmic scale. So that the old <laughs> data, I mean, it's even more ridiculous than that because for some reason, I don't understand it's a reputable, uh, <laughs> no, not reputable group, but reputable institution uh, in Princeton. They actually uh, plotted this, this linear line and so that this linear line was this on double logarithmic scale, this is not a linear line. <laughs> In fact, uh, but in any event, and they said, well, this is the way how we do this. Now, when uh, the uh, authors of this paper uh, tried to fit their data with, um, mm, with this formula and plot that on logarithmic scale. So this again is the same data fit with the same formula, but now plot, plot is the same way. You can see that it's not 
true. It doesn't really work that way. Whatever they fit it is not this formula. Uh, and then uh, turned out that the real data uh, can be um, can be uh, fitted in a uh, fantastically good way uh, um, with an additional. Uh, additional term and anyway i was in the theory part on that paper i think we uh we have very good idea uh that where this storm is coming from it's probably coming from spin fluctuations but it's a completely different story so this is what i called uh and by the way the claim that this paper wanted to prove is now has been refuted by uh different independent experiments uh, they wanted this to have this proof that it's a churn, um, churn pen there, and uh, it was not. Now we know that experimentally. But in any event, so this is the, this is a very common problem, and it's not really uh, uh, even explicit dishonesty. It's just the uh, desire to present your way. Also, cherry picking data is also belonging to this. Well, you have some part of your uh, data which don't fit your interpretation, then don't show that. That's uh, another problem. Now, uh, mm, then of course, uh, there are uh, quite a few things uh, that uh, this, I would call the data massage, which is now on the border of true uh, dishonesty. Uh, when you, and you know, this we, we heard about that before. Uh, one other thing which had not been explicitly mentioned, it's a uh, mm, thing, well, we uh, got this and they got uh, that on a different material and our results are different, which proves that we have this physics that that other problem. And then you look and you see that the measurements were done under different conditions. The sample quality was very different. And uh, so this way you can prove many things which are not actually true, or proof, quote unquote. And of course, there's um, data uh, falsification, which we heard a lot before. So I think that uh, we can probably try to find uh, one and every of these uh, individual uh, problems. But the main problem is that many people uh, raised that point before is that there is a high payoff and low risk for publishing an irreproducible result. Again, I'm just reiterating what we discussed yesterday. I think the main goal and ultimate solution is somehow to make uh, public shaming or whatever you call it, to make risk for being exposed for the result to be so severe that it would outweigh the uh, benefits of doing that. Now, specific problem in my particular case, one thing is a lack of prof professionalism. In fact, that's also becoming a problem in experimental physics because now there are commercially available beautiful machines for measuring everything. And uh, as always, I mean, people who cannot, uh, uh, who never learn how to drive, cannot uh, go and participate in uh, NASDAQ races. Um, but for some reason, people think that if they can buy sufficiently expensive machine and put there uh, whatever samples they can uh, get from their body, uh, they will um, have a great scientific result. It's even bigger problem with first principle calculations. There are too many, too Band structure codes now. As a colleague of mine from France mentioned that band structure codes have become so foolproof that they attract too many fools. The fact that you successfully install the call, and, and again, how that goes. So you are experimentalist, you measure something, you want to write a paper and say, well, ah, would be nice to have some Fermi surface here. So you call a student and say, hey, uh, download this code, uh, run it and give me Fermi surface. And you know, person goes and install and produce results. It does not guarantee that it has produced correct results. You actually know, need to know many things. And I know some codes, I don't know other codes. If you uh, really work and have good, good experience, then you can tell uh, whether you have done everything right or not. What uh, case study, it's uh, now a very fashionable uh, subject, so-called altermagnetism. Uh, so it was first, um, the first material which was uh, theoretically identified uh, is ruthenium dioxide. And there was a background. They were published data on unpolarized neutron scattering, which suggested that M uh, magnetic moment that is magnetically ordered, magnetic moment is, uh, is, uh, is uh, 0.4. There were a number of uh, red flags in this experimental uh, paper. Not in the sense that this was a bad paper, in the sense that people were aware that the results are uh, should be taken with a really big grain of salt, and they were very honest about that. Uh, they said first they tried uh, then 
polarized neutron. The, yeah, the feed that they got was actually pretty poor, and they said about it explicitly. They tried polarized neutrons. These polarized neutrons, they get 0 0.05, which is order of magnitude lower, and which is, and again, that was, and they also never uh, detected any phase transition up to 350 Kelvin. So how can you have a uh, magnetic transition above 350 Kelvin if your magnetic moment is 0.05? And the author of this paper were aware of that and they did it. Now, then uh, mm, the group of people came, which were just read this one number of this paper, and then they put that number in the, and then they do calculations and calculations do not produce this number. They produce zero. So then they well, they might be a uh, strong correlation here, which I'm not accounting for, so let's add them. When you add something to equation, you always should think whether there is a physical reason for doing that. Rutinium dioxide is a 4D material, not particularly strongly correlated species, and it's a very good metal. Uh, it's highly unlikely that um, this Hubbard repulsion place decided for all there. Anyway, then, uh, mm, yeah, said, uh, and um, then, mm, there were probably, I would say, maybe a dozen of papers now already where people are doing some measurements. They measure God knows what, uh, and then they uh, then they uh, do DFT calculations, which are forced. Uh, and it's not secret. I mean, they say, well, we did, did this and that to get this magnetic moment, and then they get marvelous agreement with the uh, sorry for a typo with the experiment. And now uh, they look at that and. Uh, Mm, and by now, we have now the unbeatable experimental data with um, mu star scattering showing that there is no long range magnetic order or not any static magnetic order in this compound at all. Uh, and we, they even figure out what was wrong with the original neutron scattering, the sort of called multiple uh, scattering. Now, another specific problem. Well, um, we were yesterday, we um, heard about this point made that uh, now many collaborations are very broad range. So there are people who make samples, people who characterize samples, measure stuff. Some people measure NMR, other people measure anomalous Hall effect on the same compound. Then there are uh, model series, which do some model calculations, bands structures, and nobody talks to anybody. No, that's, and what, uh, that's not acceptable, in fact. I'm working with experimentalists. I don't need to understand the details of the experiment, but I always do read the experimental part. And if I don't understand the physical meaning of some of their claims, I come, I go to them and I say, well, you know, let's think about it. Let's explain that. Uh, that's unfortunately it doesn't really work mm, that way always or we, we do that often. And the typical way is that uh, the it is that these DFT calculations are relegated to some sort of uh, um, visualization tool, like in old old days, which very few people here remember. When you wanted to make a plot, you would go down there when these um, ten girls were sitting at a drawing board and they were making your plot using your table. Then you would photograph that and send this photograph to FISRFB. Uh, so, people, <laughs> great number of people think that uh, that. Um, People who are doing DFT calculations is about the same as this goes downstairs in the photo lab. Uh, another, this actually is the same paper that I was recently uh, was citing about Noble's Hall effect. So they wanted to find uh, the two dimensional Dirac band is so-called as Chern physics in particular material. Uh, and it's, I know uh, from many people that this, uh, that the guy is very adamant about what he's doing and really trying to push him. So now nobody in that group uh, and the list of author uh, is a recognizable to me professional in DFT calculation. So clearly they pulled out some postdoc uh, or student and um, bought uh, DFT code for them. And actually the guy, whoever this guy was, did a very good job. The calculations are actually very uh, high quality and correct. And it turns out that if you go to this and this is, uh, then the actual, the Fermi level of these calculations is somewhere here. And the Dirac band that they wanted to have is there. So which was completely ruining the model that they, incorrect model it turned out, which they were trying to apply here. So what happens on, so this is, yeah, you, so you are a poor guy and you need to pursue your career and then your boss tell you, no, no, that sets cannot be right. We, of course there should be a Dirac band there. And then after all, after sleepless night, the guy comes back and says, well, okay, this is my new calculation. What he did or she did, uh, they took a ruler and just drew a new Fermi level, half electron volt away from where it really was. And it was published, it was published in Nature. 
Awesome, right? So no. Uh, you look at this, it's because it's nature, there's always uh, question. You cannot find any author mentioned to be responsible for these band structure calculations, which were a substantial part of the paper. So that is a problem. Uh, theoretical analysis. Huh? Theoretical analysis. Yeah, but I mean, what theoretical analysis? There was a lot of, of analytical theories there. And I'm pretty sure that, I don't know these people, I'm pretty sure that what they, in fact, I do know some of these initials and I, I'm i pretty sure that all of them were, are, um, were doing analytical theory. Because nobody was explicitly mentioned as doing construct calculations. So I have, and very few names, there are a lot of unknown, like Chinese or other names here, which I just don't know. Um, anyway, uh, another specific problem is a lack of understanding. So let me give you a case. So there is, we all know that there is DFT, which sometimes is called LDE, uh, so, but um, another flavor called GF, it doesn't really matter. You can read the text. So in pretty old paper, uh, there was um, something proposed, which was called LDA plus U. Sure. Very ingenious. Uh, and I was uh, sitting next to this people uh, when this paper was being done was a um, it was a dramatic problem with um, mm, mm, not accounting properly for local strong correlations in a unique material copper two plus ion uh, copper based superconductors and then there was this uh, young Zanon's idea that you can actually add by hand a piece of Hubbard Hamiltonian to and then you can correct for this specific problem. What people do not understand, correct, at a cost of losing some accuracy in other more mundane things like just calculating electrostatic interaction. Uh, so then it was things proliferated, then it was LDA plus uh, plus by Misha and Sasha, uh, and uh, LDA plus DMFT, um, which is uh, also these people and quite a number of other people um, produce. Uh, and it's all very good. It's all helpful when you do understand the physics of the material and you realize that there is something very important that is missing, and then you have to sacrifice some of your numerical accuracy in your straightforward DFT calculations. Uh, but account for this important physics. But if, uh, but mm, it's necessary sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice. It's 90% uh, uh, of people who are familiar with these uh, mm, acronyms uh, do not realize that it's not DFT plus something, it's DFT plus more tuning knobs minus accuracy. Mm, and you have to be, we have experienced many times, we submit a paper and say, well, why these people, why didn't you do uh, LDA plus DMFT? Well, because we know the physical system, we know that it's not necessary there. That's why. Now, of course, uh, a really mundane thing is negligence to publish technical details. And I don't think that data repository and forcing people to uh, upload some crap on the on some unknown obscure service server is uh, so. It's really the climate uh, in the community and the improving our. Uh, common sociology. Now, case study, another case study. It's a very famous uh, compound, vanadium dioxide, extremely interesting. It forms these this, um, vanadium dimers, which are actually quantum mechanical dimers. So this is this, which is not part of the mean field um, DFT, DM, DFT theory, not part even DMFT, cluster DMFT, which Gabi Cutler did, does capture this. But, um, Nothing else can. And uh, uh, we fully um, understand what is the problem and there's why this problem is not solvable. So that's where uh, various things how can be work around. But now let me just, it's a verbatim quote. I don't give the name uh, from uh, written by uh, my collaborator and myself in 2018. And let me see what Tom writes. Myself and my colleague Igor Martin here at the Naval Research Lab have been working on simulation of science. We were very interested to read your recent paper, this paper, where you were able to stabilize the non-magnetic dimer structure for VO2, which would not be possible. Uh, however, we've been having a hard time, we tried hard to reproduce your results. Uh, there's lower energy for the paramagnetic state compared to antiferromagnetic state. And I just remind you, this is just experimental, it's paramagnetic because it has spin up and spin down, uh, also, you know, fluctuating with, with down up, so on average, you know, but it's not this, but uh, in mean field methods converge universally to, uh, to 
uh, anti-ferromagnetic solution. So they use this uh, particular method. So would you be able to share the input file used in your group? No, this is the answer. Norman Eager, the postdocs that did this works are not with me anymore. I will contact them and have them get in touch with you as soon as possible. So that was in 2018. So far, uh, nobody has contacted us about that. All right. Uh, am I? How much time do you have? No time? Sometime? I ask you to give me a buzz of five minutes. All right. So a little, just maybe just a few words. So that is the, I think that's the single most important problem. What can you do to find is increase the risk. Uh, in particular, and in particularly, uh, that we should facilitate uh, re, uh, rebuttals of um, refuting um, wrong papers. And a paper which refutes a publication in Nature, Science, paper, whatever, uh, I think it should be in the uh, written rules, bylines, that is automatically qualified in terms of relevance and importance. The referee should not uh, um, judge it on that side. That's automatically relevant and important. And uh, okay, that's it. Thank you. So we have heard a lot about uh, experimental uh, issues with reproducibility in experiments. We've heard very little till now on theory. So my first question is, is there actually less, I mean, the reproducibility issue is less prevalent in theory than in experiments, or is it just that we haven't looked as closely i mean it's uh, it's very hard to estimate uh, the prevalence or pinpoint the number of I mean, what what percentage of the paper and it's also a gray area a lot um how to me i mean having uh considerable experience in this range i know uh i maintain a list in my head of people who i know to be responsible and trustworthy and to have all uh, possible checks. Um, and there are, of course, many papers from other people where I'm being skeptical and I can't really say what, how many and where, and it depends on where it's published and so on. Um, yeah, it, I can't answer this question. I think the problem One is quick. there. It's probably uh, on the same order of magnitude as an experiment. Not more, not less. One quick comment. The comment is that, so if you're doing DMF, DFT calculations, those can be checked because those are not as costly computationally. But oh, things, that depends. But on the other hand, if you have DMFT calculations, then it's much more costly on some compounds and you need big clusters. So people are probably not so... Um, uh, uh, quick to try to check those calculations, well, and which is also akin to experiments, right? A lot of these checking needs a yeah. lot of effort. Uh, it's the same problem, like, you know, yes, you can check experiments in uh, diamond anvil cell, but there's only a handful uh, of group in the world who can afford that. Uh, and in many cases, just payoff is no of uh, repeating uh, experiment and finding that it was, or not finding that it was wrong. Uh, it's not just worth all time uh, invested in this. I think it's a little bit better uh, in the uh, calculations simply because um, at least in terms of uh, dollars is less, the, the people can afford a large cluster, a lot of computer time, much easier than to buy a new uh, diamond anvil cell setup. So that's a bit easier. Yeah. So Igor, thanks so much. Um, so you said uh, depositing data is not a solution, but the example you give is, you know, if those postdocs already shared their code online, it would be easy. And the same with diamond anvil people, why can't, you know, it's hard to reproduce a diamond cell, I agree, but it's very easy to plot resistance versus temperature. And uh, with the undergraduate degree, you can check if the background was subtracted or not. Right, so that would be seems like it contradicts. No, I mean, there's your, nothing, nothing your thesis about here. This report, but I would just want to um, warn. About, it's not a panacea. That's the problem. Um, like it's most likely in that case, you know, this postdoc is uh, going back to the home country, whatever they would uh, upload, whatever they want, whether that there is enough information to reproduce their calculations or not. It's completely unclear. Nobody is going to check the actual upload at the moment of upload to see whether it really contains all data that they uh, need to do, all trial errors and so on, convergence tests. Uh, 
nobody knows. The same is, mm, yeah, I mean, it's uh, possible. It's, but I don't understand. I don't know when when a reasonable person, and it's, um, I emphasize, a reasonable, not a person who has known to be unreasonable in these things, uh, request um, the, the data that were used to plot. I can hardly imagine that uh, normal experimentalists would refuse to provide this data. But from the reason, still data doesn't change workers. Well, we can we can talk about later. I think it does. It damages people. Takes the time that these people. I I, I talk with unreasonable people many times uh, in different aspects. Like try to talk uh, sense into anti vaxxer They will just wear you down with all their demands and uh, uh, requests of more information and and more proof and whatever. It just doesn't work. If you were ever in internet discussions, it's even if you are telling absolutely obvious thing, it's nearly impossible to convince anybody. Yeah, um, I wanted to go back to the, the question from over here. I, I would I would posit that it's not so much that the problem of reproducibility is more prevalent in computation. In fact, in computation, we know in principle exactly how to reproduce anything. If you have all of the input scripts and perhaps you know the other variable is you know versions of any soft particular versions of any software you used, anyone again with sufficient compute can in principle reproduce sh should in principle be able to reproduce results exactly i think the the problem is a slightly different one which is one that igor highlighted which is are those results physically meaningful or put in a put in an experimental framing are you measuring what you think you're measuring right if you sort of turn all these knobs and change these parameters in ways to to get something that looks like the result you think you want have you have you actually simulated anything that corresponds in a meaningful way to physical reality, right? I tell my students all the time that the the sort of, there's an art and a science to computational science. And part of the art is convincing first yourself and then other people that the simulation that you've done has anything to do with reality, even though we might've only simulated a hundred atoms when of course a sample that an experimentalist would measure is, is you know, many, many orders of magnitude more than that. So I think I think the challenge is is probably similarly prevalent, but qualitatively different in ways that I thought the talk highlighted well. Uh, before I get kicked out from this podium, I just want to share one other thing. Uh, I don't know if anybody here ever met Volker Heine, uh, who is an absolutely amazing individual and uh, one of the fathers of our field. So Volker Heine, I think in around 1973 or 74, wrote an essay where he said that uh, if the theorist, and he meant computational theorist, uh, gets a result which agrees with experiment, the only useful information extractable from there is that the experimentalist, the theorist, and the Lord all believe in the same Schrodinger equation. The useful way to is to analyze them and to get physical insight from whether they uh, are successful or fail to reproduce something. In both cases, more likely than not, you can extract useful physical insight. And no, the goal is not to reproduce experiment, the goal is to get physical insight.